Oh, hello, everybody. It's time to get started. It's the Element of Excellent Book Clubs tonight with a whole host of wonderful authors and two co-hosts, um, excuse me, a whole set of wonderful authors and two co-hosts to help us bring them to you. Um, I am Carrie, the director of Heartland Fall Forum, and this is our final author event for the season. So we're so thrilled that you are here. At this point in time, since we are getting to the end of Heartland, the website is chock full of good stuff. The book room is full of a ton of different titles for you to explore based on an author's region and where they live and their states. You can request ARCs. You can click to go through a specific point in a sales rep's presentation if they talked about that book. Um, so please go ahead and hang out in the book room. And also, Rep Picks. That page is full of different videos with Rep Picks sharing all the titles that they think will help make your quarter four and your early part of 2022. So please go check it out and have a good time there. Um, and then our final event for Heartland will be Tuesday, November 16th. We have a Scholastic after party. The Pub, excuse me, the editors at Scholastic will be sharing um, sneak peeks of their upcoming lists with our booksellers. And there's a box of goodies to be sent to everybody who uh, registers by a certain date. So please head over to the events page at Heartland and register for that event. Um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our two hosts. We have Bracco Roy, an anthropologist, world traveler, writer, and 15 year veteran of the book industry. She owns River Dog Book Company, a location independent bookstore focused on diverse, global, inclusive, and representative books. She also recently joined the publisher Sourcebooks as the marketing manager working with the Indie Bookstore channel. And she's also a member of our board. We love her and couldn't live without her. She lives with her wife in <laughs> Sullivan, Wisconsin. So thank you for joining us, Bracca. And Lene Robinson is one half of the dynamic duo behind Bliss Books and Wine in Kansas City, Missouri. Founded in 2019 with her sister, Lanesha, they set out to create a community safe space to bridge the gap between social drinking and introverted reading. By day, Lene is a full-time software engineer, and by night and all of the minutes and hours in between, she is a wife, mother of three, newly minted dog mom, and of course, a bookseller, encouraging you to take Bliss's motto seriously, read, sip, and relax. So thank you both for joining us, and go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Carrie and Lene. I know we said this already, but it is so nice to meet you in person because we just found out that we both friendly faced uh, uh, social media stalk each other's stores. So <laughs> <I'll follow you. laughs> I love everything that you have going on with your shop. And um, for everyone that is joining us tonight, both Lene and I have these really non traditional models that would love to also, I mean, we're not. I somehow got muted. So I'm going to unmute myself. Um, somehow we would not turn down a physical space, but I think that we've really entered into the book club world in a really creative way because both of our spaces are non-traditional. Um, so like, I know I used to run in-person book clubs all the time. I love a book club. If there's a book club anywhere, I'm going to be in it. I'm going to help run it. I'm going to probably overpower it with my enthusiasm unintentionally. I'm sorry if you've been in one of those with me. Um, but then we had got into pandemic mode and it was like virtual. Okay, here we are. It's my space. Um, how did you feel about that, that switch? Like I know you had other plans and then suddenly things had to change. I did. So our plan was to uh, open our storefront um, around the spring of 2020, we were looking at spaces and preparing to sign a lease and then the pandemic hit and we were like, oh, mm -hmm. we, we dodged a bullet there. Um, so then we had to figure out a way, like you said, everybody had to try to pivot and find something different. Um, so we were trying to figure out a way to still get everyone involved since we were all stuck at home and what better things to do when you're stuck at home than to read and have mine and you know just converse with your friends so we had the bright idea in april of last year to start holding a virtual book club we're like we'll put it on we'll see if anyone at all joins besides our mother and our aunts <laughs> <laughs> my mom was at my first few shout out to the moms out there y'all moms are awesome um we were like we'll see where this you know will go and i think we're coming up on our 19th book or so, um, which is really exciting. So yeah, it, it's it's weird in that um, we're not in person and we can't, it's just a different vibe, but 
we have members all over the country. So I, I don't see us going back to just strictly in person because we would talk to many of our, of our people and, you know, we're a, now a big, gigantic community. <laughs> so it, it's been an awesome experience. And everyone brings something different to the tables. Good times. I love that. I- I love that that somehow we've made our community smaller, even as it's grown larger. Like we've dialed in on who wants to read these books. They're all over the country. For some of us, they might be all over the world. Yes. Um, I had an uh, armchair travel book club that met virtually. And we would have, you know, people dial in from, from France. A friend of mine got up in New Zealand um, for a book that she was super excited to talk about. It was like four in the morning for her and joined us. Um, and yet it made our community feel so much tighter, I guess, not smaller. Um, mm-hmm. Right? We grew worldwide or countrywide. And yet we could talk with the people we wanted to reach about the topics we wanted to talk about. Like I know mine are pretty, um, they're passion focused, I like to say. Like I had one on armchair travel. I had one on reading women leaders um, in different fields, of, um, you know, like politics and, and arts and social sciences. What do you like to read? Who do you want to talk to with your book club? So I am a hopeless romantic. So I love romance novels. My yeah. sister is all about fantasy and science fiction and all that stuff. And I really could care less. But the great thing about it, book that clubs, is the most sister statement I've heard in a while. <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing is, and we let our members uh, vote on the books that we're going to read. So we try oh, to pick wow. like two or three at a time and you get a, just a diverse group set of books that you go through. And a lot of times I've heard from a lot of our members that these are books they otherwise would never have picked up and tried to read it. But everyone has loved all of the picks. So it's just, it gets you out of your comfort zone. It makes you read genres that you don't care for. I will say that Lanisha was right with fantasy. I love Legendborn. We have this on tape. We have this on tape. <laughs> it's on tape. If you're here tonight, you were right at least once. She was right. <laughs> I would never have picked that book up, but Legendborn is like one of my favorite reads that we've had thus far. And I can't wait for the second one to come out. Anyway, um, so... <laughs> It, it, it's really bringing, that. yeah, it's bringing people out of their comfort zone, and it's exposing us to different authors and different genres that we never would have chosen otherwise. So, see, that is so perfect. I I love getting that when I go to other people's book clubs, and I'll admit my little bit of the type A, you know, control freak in me. I just I want to talk with people about the books I want to read already when I run my own book club. So I admit I, I choose the books. I'm like, if you want to read this, come chat with me about it. Um, so enthusiastic, I hit myself in the face. Um, but I will say when I started working at Sourcebooks as the marketing manager working specifically with independent bookstores, um, I crafted this book club program that allowed any Sourcebooks title to be chosen for the book clubs. Yes, it is a shameless plug, folks, but that's also partly my job. I'm here to help all of y'all. Um, And it's because I wanted people to be able to choose whatever books that they wanted for their club. So whatever the topic is, Sourcebooks probably has a book for you. Um, I'm going to just gently drop a link in the chat. Check it out. If you need recommendations, hit me up. Um, But it's exactly for people like you that want to have their clubs vote on things or that want to explore new authors or for people like me that are like, hmm, I only want to read this right now. Everyone that wants to read that should come talk to me about it. Um, so I love that our clubs work in these different ways. Um, and I honestly, I think a lot of publishers are working with um, independent bookstores and for, for their new book clubs. And that's why we have these wonderful authors um, to talk to here today. So um, we're going to get started and let you hear from our authors now, everyone. Um, and so our first up. Um, we're going to do this in kind of a really fun way where um, Lene and I are going to go back and forth introducing an author, and we're going to have a quick lightning round where each author is going to share their elevator pitch. And under- Okay, I'll start again. <laughs> the Good Left Undone is the story of Matilda Raffo, who is the matriarch in her contemporary Italian family, and she realizes she's done a terrible job as the matriarch, and she has to set the record straight. So it's the story of her, her mother, and what truly happened to them and in in the setting of her family as her granddaughter's about to get married. Goes to France, England, you know, everywhere. Yeah. But I threw that in at the end and people are like, who cares? But (laughs) it's it's, it's two big romances in it. I mean, two big love affairs and... um, I, I love this book more than anything I've written. I think even though I, I love them all, 
They're like your <laughs> So with each new book, your new favorite? Kind of because, you you know, you've been living in it. This one, though, it's been, been a long time coming because it really took my time with it. I did a lot of research and I spent a lot of time in foreign countries before COVID and then I had COVID, you know, to sort of polish it, which was great in its own weird way. But it's the only good thing that came out of COVID. The rest of it was terrible. I'd also like to add, Adriana, that you have a killer YouTube book conversation series that you host. Uh, you should put the, the link in chat if you want to share it with everybody. I've been so entertained by it. So we do, you know, it's actually like Facebook Live, a Facebook Live vet thing. And we had it on YouTube and now we don't because we're going to move it. But I'll, you can see it on my page. Okay. All you have to do is follow it and you'll, you'll get announcements. But thank you for saying that. <laughs> I'm going to have all these authors on now. <laughs> They're great. That is a wonderful, wonderful idea. Thank you so much for your pitch. And Lene, I think it's over to you. All right, so next up we have Jacqueline. Um, Jacqueline Mitchell is a, an award-winning New York Times best-selling author of 12 novels for adults, seven novels for teenagers, and five children's books. She's pretty busy, a little something for everyone. <laughs> These include The Deep End of the Ocean, the inaugural selection of Oprah Winfrey's Book Club. You know a little something about Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> She's also a professor of creative writing whose short stories, articles, essays, and book reviews have been widely published. She's a native of Chicago and now lives in the great Cape Cod with her family. <laughs> and your upcoming book is called The Good Son? That's Throughout right. In January next year. That's right. Give us a little um, bitch about it. Okay. Adria, I haven't seen you in donkey's years. I miss you. How are you? You're absolutely <laughs> as gorgeous as ever. And this uh, ditto. Ditto. You are. You are. My, um, this is a, a romantic comedy, this book. No, I, I, all right. Um, when Thea's son gets out of prison after he's convicted uh, of a role in killing his girlfriend, Belinda, Thea must face, I'm kidding, I was kidding you guys, obviously. Thea must face her town's rejection, the activists who are galvanized by Belinda's mother who's seeking revenge, and increasingly uh, increasing anonymous threats on Stefan's life. Soon Thea realizes that Stefan is in more danger at home than he ever was in prison, and she may lose him before she even has a chance to forgive him. Wow. Okay, so I will say that my book club will definitely be interested in this because we seem to have a running theme where someone in our books always die and it's always within the first chapter. <laughs> so that's the running joke. <laughs> someone oh is dead God. right off the bat and we are <laughs> twisted and we're picking weird books. So <laughs> we're going to add this to the list. <laughs> All right, ladies, wines and spies. We have another one. And I just want to point out that um, Pamela Klingerhorn says The Good Son was a riveting read in the chat. And um, Pamela, if, if you don't know her, she has the most impeccable taste in books and she does not give praise lightly. Um, Pamela, I hope I can say that about you. Um, <laughs> no, I do. But so to say it was a riveting read, everyone who hasn't read The Good Son already, you should run out and read it. <laughs> Um, next up, we have Sharon Cameron, who you may know from a little book that got picked up by the Reese Witherspoon book club called The Light and Hidden Places in 2020, which sold into 18 different foreign countries. Um, so if you don't know her from that one, she is a many time over New York Times bestselling author of lots of other books, uh, The Dark Unwinding, A Spark and Scene, Rook. Um, her parents have won Parents' Choice Gold Awards, the Westchester Fiction Award, earned starred reviews from all the places, chosen for all the numerous lists so um you are probably well aware of her titles now one thing you might not know about her though is that she can be found shooting a longbow when she's not writing which i love because my parents are also longbow archers we're going to talk about sharon off camera um <laughs> pondering the past continuing her lifelong search for secret passages who isn't who isn't on a search for secret passages mm -hmm. honestly um, and you are in, based in Nashville, Tennessee. So thank you for bringing a little warmth to us. Give us your elevator pitch for your new book. 
Well, I am happy to. I'm so excited about my new book. It just came out on October 5th. It is called Bluebird. I happen to have a copy right here. And um, Bluebird is, um, tells this, it's a well, I guess it's a YA noir thriller uh, kind of a book. It's a little different than what I've done before, but it's very exciting to me. It tells the story of Eva, who is a German immigrant coming to New York City in 1946. Um, but she is not coming to seek a new life. She's coming to seek justice and a Nazi who has slipped its net. And she is bringing a secret with her, and that is the secret of Project Bluebird. So the book is based on two pieces of American history, uh, one of them incredibly inspiring, um, one of them incredibly shocking, and both of them, I think, completely forgotten. Um, but really, it's a story of the heights and depths that we can go to as human beings and our ability to transform. That's wow, it. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I know that uh, Pamela also said that your last YA novel was phenomenal and that you all had a fun dinner. So this YA novel also sounds phenomenal. Um, and I always, I, my family's Jewish and I always have to put books that deal with the Holocaust on a shelf. And sometimes I read them and sometimes I'm, I'm like, I tell my wife to read them and let me know if there's anything that's going to really trigger me too much but that <laughs> sounds fascinating because I love the combined histories that you put thank in you. there so thank really you excited to pick that one up very soon thank you thanks over to you Anae oh thanks Sharon okay so next up we have Carrie Mayer uh, she's the amazing author of the girl in the white gloves Kennedy debutante and under the name of Carrie Majors this is not a writing manual notes for the young writer in the real world uh, she holds an MFA from Columbia University, and she was a writing professor for many years. Lucky <laughs> students. Uh, <laughs> she now writes full time and lives with her daughter and a dog. We just love dogs. We had a whole conversation earlier. He's right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Has a dog in, in the leafy suburb, uh, suburbs west of Boston, Massachusetts. And her book will all love is the Paris bookseller also due out in January of next year. So what do you have for us? Well, first of all, I, I have to say I'm totally starstruck, you know, having like read books by many of our panelists. I'm like just so honored to be here. So thank you for having me. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, the Paris bookseller, I mean, you know, really the two words are in the title Paris and bookseller. Um, but it is about, you know, everything. It is about Sylvia Beach, who is the American woman, the real life American woman who opened the original Shakespeare and Company bookstore in Paris in 1919. And, you know, so much of what the two of you were saying earlier about being these, you know, you didn't say this about yourself, but I'm going to say amazing trailblazing female booksellers she was really, you know, the first. And, you know, she did it in Paris and all the writers of the lost generation came to her store. Hemingway was a lifelong friend. And one, in addition, to, I mean, as if that wasn't enough, um, when she, in 1922, she published the very first edition of James Joyce's novel, Ulysses, after it had been banned and convicted of obscenity in 1921. And so my book is coming out right on the 100th anniversary of her edition of Ulysses. So, you know, it's really books, bookstores, and, you know, Paris is what this book is about. So I think there's lots, lots for books, bookstores and, and book clubs to talk about in it. Oh, man, my list is exploding. I, <laughs> I know, right? Have a kid more bookshelves. That's okay. He'll get over it. <laughs> add There's another one to the pile. In this room, I think, Lene. So I'm with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> There's obviously a place for this book on ours in our house as well. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Thiridi Omergar. 
uh, best-selling author of eight novels, including The Space Between Us, which um, I have to say, my wife and I, when we merged our bookshelves, we both had copies of your book. So clearly it was meant to be, and we both kept copies, um, our copies of your books, actually, because we both had notes and things in them. So thank you for writing the book and letting us know it, it was a good choice. So, um, but I also think that, um, or sorry, not think, I know that you have these beautiful um, memoirs, three picture books, you have a little bit of something for everyone in there. Um, and you are received so many incredible uh, awards um, for your books. So I love that the your books have reached out into the world and really gotten the recognition that they deserve, um, including things like the Nyman Fellowship to Harvard, including things like a Lambda Literary Award, um, the Seth Rosenberg Award, um, and now you're a distinguished professor of English at Case Western Reserve University. And of course you contribute regularly. I love to read your articles um, in places like the Boston Globe and New York Times and HuffPo. Can you please tell us a little bit about your upcoming book? I would love to, and thank you for that wildly generous uh, introduction. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this great panel. I, I so regret that this is not real life because I know we'd all be going out for drinks immediately after <laughs> if, we were, if we were on an actual panel, but we will make do at least for <laughs> another year or two with what we have. Um, anyway, so my book is called Honor and it's coming out by Algonquin also in January um, of next year. Um, and I was inspired to write the book after reading a series of articles that ran in the New York Times about the treatment of women in rural India. I, after I read those articles, I came up with this character of Meena and she's just a young Hindu peasant woman who until now has led a very conventional life until she breaks two taboos. One, she chooses to work outside her home and two, she falls in love with a Muslim man. And for these crimes, Mina pays a very high price. Um, I also wanted a character who was a counterpoint to Mina. And so I created Smita and who is, she's an educated, sophisticated, a very successful Indian American journalist who returns very reluctantly to India to cover Mina's story. Uh, Smita has her own reasons for avoiding and dreading her visit to India, which will become clear to us over the course of the novel. Uh, the only other thing I wanna say is, this, from what I've described, this probably sounds like a very heavy and depressing novel given the subject matter, but I hope that honor is more than that uh, because the novel is actually, it sort of tells two parallel love stories. The main story of Mina's growing affection and love for Abdul, who is a Muslim guy, poor, uh, working class, but very idealistic, a man who imagines that he and his Hindu wife can be citizens of a new and modern India. And also Smita's own parallel love story where not only does she meet this guy and kind of develops feelings for him, but also perhaps develops feelings for India, a country that she has avoided for a long time. And essentially I was trying to answer one question in this novel, which is, how do and where do humble, ordinary people like Mina and Abdul get the courage that it takes to defy tradition and custom? Maybe they are, as Smita says at one point, simply a different tribe of people, those who are willing to love unconditionally and sacrifice everything. Um, and that's the question that I'm trying to answer uh, with this novel. So thank you. What a beautiful question to, to answer, to ask. Um, I think that there are still so many people all around the world and in this country too that are um, struggling with those questions or that have hope uh, to answer those questions. Um, and uh, Pamela Klingerhorn again in the chat says, honor provides hope for the future at the end of the novel. Um, so for anyone that hasn't read it yet, um, that, that seal of, of, that ring of approval and truth at the end that it's going to continue to be uplifting and give you that hope, I think is, is really beautiful. Bookseller stamp of approval on there. So <laughs> that's wonderful. Now we're gonna head into a really exciting uh, part of this, um, uh, this experience where uh, the authors are going to be asking each other a dinner party conversation question. So um, Lene and I are actually gonna go away and Adriana, you are up. Hey, well, I am a, a longtime fan of Jacqueline Machard. I always said Machard, is it 
Metchard or? Yes, Metchard. That's why you always said it. <laughs> well, but other people say it different ways, so I don't want to, you know. No. Anyway. It's the, it's the, it comes from the lyric Canadian name, Meat Yard. Which is a great name, too. No, it, well, no not really, especially if you're a vegetarian. Um, but there you have it, you know. There you have it. Somebody who hunts prey. <laughs> you, you guys should go on the road together. You'd make a great <laughs> comedy team. We wouldn't have a good time, too. Yeah, so we'd have a lot of fun. Um, okay, Jackie, here's my question. I want you to think carefully about this because you've only been asked maybe quite a bit, but movies have the Oscars, TV has the Emmys, um, we got the Tony Awards in theater, and in books, really, it's getting picked by Oprah. You were, the first, you were the first author picked by Oprah. Will you tell us what that was like? Well, you know, not in the, it wasn't the same as it was for everybody else because I was the first one. And my publisher at that time said to me, okay, this is all well and fine, Jackie, but it's not going to mean anything because TV and books are antithetical media. And I said, okay. And she said, so don't expect a lot. I said, okay. And, um, and so, uh, and Oprah, you know, Oprah Winfrey had called, you know, in the old days, and you and I can remember the old days, because we've been doing this for a while. They had answering machines that had little tapes on them that went for like five minutes. Okay. And the first time, you know, I, I had my little um, office in Madison, Wisconsin, in the basement, and my a little a college intern said, listen, Jack, that's Oprah Winfrey. And I just erased that. She said, I have loved the deep end of the ocean more than I've loved any book that I've read. And I said, beep. I said, oh, that's one of my girlfriends horsing around with me. So the next day there was another message. And she said, I don't know if you live here or not, but if you do, could you please return my call? And I erased that too. And the third day, you know, my assistant said, Jack, I think that really is Oprah Winfrey. She's really mad now. And she said, I don't know who you are or if you even live here, but could you please do me the courtesy of returning my phone call? And so I returned and I was laughing. She wasn't laughing as much, I must tell you. And uh, she said, I'm going to, we're going to have the world's largest book club. Okay. And then the rest is history. But the truth, the interesting part is my publisher was wrong. And the public, because by Nine o'clock on the night that she announced that there were 4,000 holds on the book at the New York Public Library, and they had to borrow uh, other printing presses to print the book, as many of the books as they now, needed to sell. You know why I asked you this question? Because we're talking oh, no. to booksellers. Well, no, we're talking to booksellers. Right. And booksellers understand that there's these fashions that ebb and flow. Our libraries are very steady, you know, um, but, it, but it was important then. It changed the national conversation about reading because those of us that have gone on, you know, the television shows, low, it could be low. Listen, guys, it's nothing fancy about the big ones. They're all the same. They've never read the book. So the conversation's always like, it's lame. That's why I started doing it three years ago because I thought, well, I read. So well, I it, is lame. You. it is lame because they're they're reading off the frontispiece, piece, the piece that you've written for the publisher on the jacket copy and saying it says here that, you know, and they haven't read the book. They're just, you know, you were there, you were in town or you live there. And so they feel obliged to feature you. But these wonderful like that have happened to some of our fellow panelists here, these wonderful picks by people who are really influencers, as they say, and are big readers. I mean, it's thrilling. Books are meant to be gossiped about. Don't you agree? That's the I purpose of books. And shared and the, uh, the notion of book clubs. I, uh, you know, I love book clubs because you can have an in-depth conversation. And I feel most of the conversation that goes on now in our country is, is um, dumb. It it's indeed it is. And, and here you can come in and you can talk about, about something that's important. Well, they're dumb and they're toxic. And, and even though book club, a great book club book, there should be plenty to disagree about. 
there should be plenty. People should be saying, I hated that character. Oh, I thought she was wonderful. You know, there should be a, a wide range of things to discuss and disagree about, but it should be something that you can really sink your teeth into as a human being. Because if we don't have stories, what do we have? Nothing. This is the best dinner conversation for me, for us to all be flies on the wall for this. Um, I, I would love for you all to produce that, that podcast, that YouTube series, the whatever it is that the two of you are clearly, this is the genesis of that moment. Um, thank you so much for the sound bites. Um, Even books they're talent the agents here. Not only are they booksellers, they're talent agents. That's right. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much, Adriana. And Jacqueline, it is your turn to ask your dinner party guest. Okay, Carrie, I have read two of your books <gasps> in the last four days. I can tell you that. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and I love them. And I want to say, okay, when I write a book, people don't care if, um, if uh, there's they don't care if there's murder and mayhem and and all kinds of other unnatural behavior. Um, what they care about is if you get it wrong and you say that there used to be a taco stand at the corner of 60th Street and Grand Avenue in Chicago, people are going to write to you till the end of your life. And they're <laughs> going to say, listen, I'm, I grew up near there. There was never a taco stand there. There was a donut stand there once, but not tacos. And I say, well, it's fiction. And they, and they write back and say, no, my grandmother said the same thing when she read. Well, so you're writing about real people. I know. You're writing about people who existed, and you're, but you're writing a novel. Do you ever get slapped for stuff like that? <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, with the Kennedy debutante, I had a few um, readers um, I, I should preface this by saying I try not to go down like the rabbit hole of the Amazon reviews and the Goodreads reviews where I think a lot of this kind of critique is lurking. Um, so but but there were there have definitely been some readers who who went so far as to, you know, to to find me on on my website and email me and say so. You know, bizarrely, this didn't happen with with the Grace Kelly novel, the one, the girl in white gloves. So um, I was expecting it to actually, but it happened a few times with the Ken. I'm sorry, my dog is whining. Um, it happened a few times with the Kennedy debutante, um, and you know, it was small. It they were small critiques, but I was like, eek. Um, so yeah, it definitely happens. And, you know, I, I try so hard to get my facts straight. And this is where, um, you know, people who love to hear about process, one of my favorite stories is about my first experience with copy editing, um, my, a historical novel. Um, it wasn't just, you know, dotting your I's and crossing your T's, it was also checking my facts. And so I had this scene in the Kennedy debutante where Kick Kennedy, her mother, Rose, was wearing a particular tiara. Like it's a known, it was a known tiara. I cannot right now call to mind the name of the tiara. So the, 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 and I had it described as having diamonds and rubies. The, 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 the copy editor highlights it and says, I found a description of this tiara as platinum and diamonds with no rubies. Do you have an alternate source? <laughs> <laughs> and oh, wow. I spent a whole day going back to my research to figure out why I had described it as having rubies in it. And in the end, all I could decide was I made it up. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, I didn't think to look it up. Um, so all hail copy editors. Um, so, and I think most writers I know have a story like that of the copy editor who finds the thing, but you know, it's hard to find everything. And, you know, to your point, you know, the hot dog stand and the donut stand, you know, sometimes you just don't know. <laughs> in a book that I wrote one time um, in the translation, I forget whether it was Japan or someplace, um, <clears throat> you use the expression, you know, she, she wanted to be out of her mind. She wanted to be a few ants shy of a picnic, right? Sure. Right. And the translator wrote, um, she was very sad. She felt like an ant who had not been invited to the picnic. <laughs> That's <laughs> fabulous. I love that. That's anyway, great. thank you so much, Carrie. That's great. Thank you so much. <laughs>
All right. So Sharon, hello. <laughs> um, it is great to have you. It's great to be able to ask you this question, um, especially because we're on a panel with so many writers who have dabbled in multiple age groups, writing from in multiple age groups. And, you know, once upon a time I had a niche in YA. And so one of the things I find most intriguing about your books is, you know, it's some pretty heavy subject matter. And so I wonder, like, with your, especially with your two most recent books, how did you know you were writing young adult? Like if you just read the description, it, it truly could be an adult novel. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what, how, what you might have to say about that. It's well, it's, it's an interesting question for me um, because all of my books so far have been young adult. Um, but I, you know, I just, I've never actually deliberately written a young adult novel. I didn't know that's what I was writing. Um, you know, when I when I very first started, I writing is um, something that I came to quite late in my life. I was actually a musician for, oh gosh, 23 years before um, I turned full time to writing. And so um, I always just kind of wrote the things that, that interested me, the things that I was passionate about. And um, none of my books are really teens being teens. Um, and my husband says this is a very natural uh, problem because I was 30 when I was 10 and I was never an actual real teenager. So maybe it's just the way things come out of me. So all of my books, because, you know, the main character is um, usually um, in that sort of upper, uh, you know, teen range of 17, 18, normally that's, you know, kind of where I tend to write. But I tend to write about subjects that I think are just important no matter what. So, so that subject matter that you were talking about, you know, that, that is heavy. My last two books have been about the Holocaust and um, Nazi philosophy and what that does uh, to a person, what that does to the world. Um, and that, that is, the, these are issues that are universal. Um, I don't think it matters what age you are. Um, these are important things to back up, to look at yourself, to put yourself in this position um, of, of history, because we, we all know that even though these books are about history, they're, they're about now as well. Yeah. Right? right. You know, the, right. the cool. yeah, uh, you know, the, the hate that created the Holocaust did not conveniently die and go away, you know, with Hitler. This is, this is part of our world. And I think it's something that we have to keep coming back to no matter what the age, our age is, you know, we never hit this magic adult stage um, right. where we have nothing else to learn and we never change. It's just, we continue to change. So I think I just tend to hit these stories with characters who are confronting sometimes those first big decisions or those first big changes in their life. But these are universal subjects, um, not only because we don't want to forget what happened, during World War II, during, you know, during the Holocaust, we cannot forget it. We need these stories um, to create that empathy, right? When we feel it, we won't yes. forget it. And when really, who better to, to read and confront these stories than, our, than young people, right? And, um, and it's, it's also no secret that adults read young adult literature also. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, not a secret. <laughs> yeah, it is not a secret. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so interesting. Yeah, I, I just think, I think that, um, I don't know, I think at, at, when it comes down to it, I think we all write because we are passionate about something, right? And that is what translates, you know, into our books. It's, it's that passion. And it's that passion, um, you know, coming into a good story. And stories, good stories are for everybody, you know, I didn't Harry Potter show us that, you know, um, that everybody read that because it was a great story and it didn't matter what age you were. And I think that um, for, for my books, even though the subject matter is heavy, it's it's subject matter that we all need to look at and understand and allow to challenge us. We these books should challenge us. So I think that is. What, what they, I think, I hope that's what my books do. I hope that's what they do. Thank you, Sharon. You're welcome.
Is it my turn? Do I get to ask the question yes. now? Yes, I get to I get to ask you, Thridi. I'm so glad. I'm so excited um, to get to to talk to you. So um I was so I'm I'm so interested um in authors who are maybe more globally minded than we often are, I think, in America and when we're writing fiction. And so obviously, um, India has been, you know, a huge part of of your books. And I, so I'm curious from from just a craft standpoint and a writer standpoint, is there anything that you write differently about these subject matters and these and these settings for an American audience than if you were writing, say, for a soul, you know, for for a different country solely? Wow, what a great that's an intriguing question. I don't think I've ever spent any time thinking or reflecting on that. I you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because, um, honestly, one of my core beliefs when I'm when I'm working on a project is to set aside the question of audience entirely. I mean, to mm -hmm. the best of my ability, I don't I don't allow myself to go there. There's God knows there's plenty of time when we do nothing but think about audience and marketing and all that later on when mm -hmm. the book is out in the world. But I I wanna I wanna have a kind of purity in the process of writing because let's face it, as writers, the minute the book goes to the agent and then to the publisher, it's out of our hands in a mm -hmm. in a literal way, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and in a metaphoric way. Um, so the only time to bring that kind of integrity to the process is is when we are working on it, and and to me that means operating in this, not exactly cone of silence, but, you know, in this kind of vacuum where the only thing that you're concerned with is the work itself and the characters. So I don't know that I've ever thought, you know, I'm certainly not writing to cater to an American audience. He is the supreme irony. I mean, the only exception to what I just said that I can think of is if I use a phrase from say, or a proverb from an Indian language, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of custom is to immediately translate it, right? I mean, that's true, whether you're writing, you know, in French or German or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. you immediately translate it into, into English. Um, mm -hmm. But the weird thing is, India is such a linguistically diverse country, that let's say, if I were simply writing for an Indian audience, uh, I would still be doing the same thing anyway, you know? Um, you know what is what is so interesting about your answer that I did not anticipate at all is actually how close it is to the question I just tried to answer. And you said it um, in, in, I think, a more eloquent way than I did. But I, I, I feel that exact same thing that, you know, you're trying to really not cater to an audience. I'm not thinking about writing for a YA audience. I'm thinking about trying to serve my subject matter, which I think is what what you were saying as well. Yeah. The book has to lead the writer, uh, nothing else, nobody, not even an editor, although that won't win me any popularity contest saying that <laughs> out loud. But, but no, I mean, there's a time for all of that. It's all about stages, right? And that uh -huh. first and 50th draft, that, that belongs just to us. So, um, yeah, so I, I just don't think in terms of, you know, I mean, look, the fact of the matter is, my audience is mostly American readers. You know, mm -hmm. India has a great market uh, for, for readers, but it's not a market for literary fiction, which is what I think all of us uh, try and do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, there it's more sort of pulp fiction, mass market, that kind of stuff. I'm not mm -hmm. that kind of a writer. So, mm -hmm. so whether I intend to or not, I'm mostly writing uh, for American uh, readers. And frankly, that's that's a kind of privilege for me because I do see myself as a kind of ambassador that that hopefully, if I do my job right, brings two cultures together and at least points out, you know, for all the obvious differences between a country like the States and 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 India, 
you know, that human impulse is universal, right? right. And, that's, and that's always my hope that I can write about a localized particular thing. I mean, I'm writing about honor killings in this new book. Right. So maybe one cannot relate to it in, in the details, but in the, in the emotions behind it, uh, you know, we, we, God knows we have our own blind spots in this country. And so all these things are transferable. It's like what you said about, you write about the Holocaust, but you're actually writing about us today. Mm -hmm. You know, that's right. That's, that's what right. books do. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I think it's my turn to ask the wonderful Adriana a question. Adriana, your, your story is such a, it's on, told on such a grand scale. I mean, both in terms of the time period, it really is a family saga. Um, and, what's that? You mean the good left undone? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Your, your most recent book. How do you like how swift I am? It's <laughs> great. You're like, what's the matter with her? I didn't know which book you were talking about. And I was oh like, okay. God. I'm now so that, close to everybody's thing. It's so fascinating. All right. Okay. Sorry. That, that, that's, that's a situation I didn't anticipate that you wouldn't know which book I was talking about. I didn't know. About, I didn't but, know. You're hey, okay. You know? Yeah, but, but listen. I write about is about my family. Everything. <laughs> well, that's true. That's a good point. But so I'm just wanting to know about the amount, the volume of research that undoubtedly went into the book. But my question is not so much about the details of the research. I want to know two moments, one in the research and one in the writing of the book that, that you had the most fun with, that brought you the most joy. Because tell me. Every word, <laughs> every day of every minute of every hour that I make a living doing what I love, I have no complaints. Okay. It, you know, you get, you get better at some things as you go on. You learn new things. I'm talking to you. I've never met you before. You're beautiful and you're interesting to me. And so books are just, it's like, it's like cracking open coconuts all the time. I feel like something new way I feel when I go in an independent bookstore because it's the personality of the person that owns it that comes to the fore, you know. All right, but any specific moments that you, you feel like you will remember five years from now? I knew that I had written the book of my career when I finished this book. Wow, that's mm -hmm. great. I knew it yeah. because I don't, I, I'm bad at pitching it in a log line, which I so admire you all. You're all so, you're so articulate. I can't do that with a book. Uh, it, it, it's too much of a yarn. It's like, uh, there's too many layers to it. And this particular book has, it's not just, I, I can't even bluff it off like it's intergenerational. It's not that. You read it, you know. It begins in India. Years and many cents, just as long, long, long ago, you know? Um, because this family, they were artisans, gem cutters for the Vatican. So the spirituality of my heritage and the way I was raised plays a prominent role in this, Roman Catholicism, a prominent role. And whether and, and because they are gem cutters, there's also a Jewish family. Because in Venice, per all my research, this was the hub. I came across a gentleman and I thought, ah, oh, that's going to be interesting. And then... My modern Italian family, one of my cousins married an Ethiopian. And I have, since the beginning of my career, you don't know what I did before I wrote television, and, and I would write a lot of shows with people of color because I was um, from an Appalachian town and I'm Italian and that counts as color. Okay, so wrote on a lot of those shows. And, um, and so I have like a... a I want to call it a, um, a desire to pull the storylines through that are actually real. And when you tell the truth, there's always people of color in your story. They just are. If you ignore it, I mean, listen, I'm not going to speak for anybody. I'm going to speak for myself. I mean, when you start digging and you realize um, 
that that the rings you wear that those stones are old and you don't know how many people wore them took a class at christie's with maharajas and muggles which is where i really learned about that side of things um research to me it's like it's i just keep cracking things open so but but let me set this up by saying this i was in scotland i had agreed to direct a movie and i was by myself my 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 family was not with me yet. And I decided to just start with the letter A and make a list of the places I wanted to go in Glasgow, where, by the way, President Biden's on his way there right now. So I set out on foot, and the first place I went was St. Andrew's Cathedral. What was intriguing to me, it was Protestant for like 350 years, and it flipped back to Catholic. You know, I love when things flip, because I want to see, like, what does it mean when something flips? So there was a wedding there. And the wedding was um, uh, really beautiful. And I was in the back of the church and it was me and the bagpiper and I crashed it. I, did, I wasn't going to go to the reception, but I was sucked into this and there's a wedding in the movie I directed. So I thought, let me look at this. I was taking pictures. Of me. But then I realized that every song that my mother had chosen for her funeral was being sung at that wedding. And I'm in the back of the church sobbing my eyes out like ridiculous. I sneak back outside because it started, they start to play the, 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 um, the processional and I'm outside and I'm waiting and I'm taking pictures and a man behind me goes, who are you? And so I turned and it was the priest. And I said, Oh father, I said, I'm an American tourist. I'm just here. You know, I said, I got, I got all engrossed in your wedding that you just performed. He said, what's your name? I told him my name. He said, you're Italian. I said, yes, Italian-American. He said, you need to see that garden. And I swear to you, it was, it, 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 it was like this, Rippy. It's like he was gone, like in a puff, like a bird, gone, flew off. I didn't, couldn't find the guy. So I took a few more pictures, and I wandered over there by myself, and I went into the garden, and the garden became the novel. That's what happened. So when you say research, it's, it's, it's so multi-layered and so, um, I went to France, I went to Scotland and Ireland and, you know, I, and it's all in the novel. It's all in the story of the novel from what I found in the garden. That's, I couldn't have hoped for a more magnificent answer than that. That's a great answer. Thank I like you. A, I feel like a, like an idiot here. In no, I have goosebumps. I mean, what you no. say no. is incredible. Crying out loud, you know. Anyway, no, it makes perfect there. sense to all of us. It does. It does. Because readers always think of research as going into some musty library and going through, you know. But research is life. I mean, research is living. And that's, oh, that's what you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank all of you so much for asking these incredible questions and, and giving these phenomenal answers. Um, we are wrapping up here and really quickly um, before we do our, our final, final wrap up, um, Lene and I are going to give our top two tips to the booksellers that are watching uh, us tonight on um, hosting book clubs in, in this time. Um, so for me, I'll just say, um, if you want to host a book club and you would like the author to come to your book club, you have every right to reach out to the publisher and ask if that author is available to join your book club as an author event. And if they are not able to make it, as not all authors are, you can still ask your publisher for authorless event co-op. That is a thing. So if you're a co-op store and you want to um, get some of those um, dollars credited to your account, definitely ask your publisher for that. Um, and then the other tip I'll give is that search for interesting articles written by your author of that book, as well as articles about the book, and use those for a little sort of pre-event titillation um, for the folks that are coming to your event. So my top two tips, over to you, Lene. Okay, so my tips are more for your, your members. Make it fun. You don't want it to be another event that no one wants to go to. You want them to read the books. You want them to be exposed to the authors. So don't make it something that they dread doing. Even if they don't enjoy the book, <laughs> have it be a, a safe enough space where they can come in and say why they don't like the book and what they would rather read instead. Uh, and then I would also say just like what we do is um, we do interactions all through the month. So as we're reading, 
we're discussing on Facebook or on email or whatever, um, just when we get to a good part, no spoilers, but like, is anyone on chapter 32? Can't believe what happened, you know, that sort of thing. So you're, you're getting everyone involved and excited about the read. So you just, I love book club. It's, it's one of my favorite <laughs> nights of the month. So I want it to be something that everyone looks forward to doing and just be excited about reading and excited about meeting and, and becoming familiar with all of the authors. Those are my two tips. Those are such great tips, Lene. I love that there is a, a writing kind of, um, I don't know, uh, just like general piece of advice leave out the parts no one wants to read i feel like events are the same way don't host events people don't want to come to yes. book clubs <laughs> included so that was perfect. thank you um to all of our writers thank you so much for joining us this thank evening you. we would love to um thank everyone for attending and then we'd in closing we'd love for you all to just throw out a favorite independent bookstore that you visited. It could be local to you. It could be far away from you. Um, I'm going to just throw a, a hello out there to Tubby and Coos, a fantasy genre um, based LGBTQ bookstore in New Orleans um, that's still there despite the many hurricanes. Um, and so that's my one of my favorites. And everyone else, just un, un mic and talk over each other and say some of your favorites. Women that's and children awesome. first in Chicago. Who are here Parnassus. Today? Parnassus. Oh, yeah. Parnassus. Parnassus. My local indie is well, Wellesley Books, and they have just been absolutely the best support, su most supportive bookstore, local bookstore I could possibly ask for. Bookmark Shop Brooklyn, Kenny's Books and Greetings in Northvale, New Jersey, um, uh, Fountain Bookstore, Richmond, Virginia. Yay, Yay Kelly! Fox Trail Books down in Georgia. Brewster Books in Brewster, Massachusetts. Anderson's in Chicago. You already said oh, that. Anderson's. Yeah, Anderson's. Warwick <laughs> in Louisiana. I, I, I think I just had a stroke. I thought you said it. Okay. <laughs> um, Loganberry Books. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Oh, huge Logan store Bear. in Cleveland. Um, just beautifully, you know, oriental rugs on the ground. Uh -huh. And my uh, one of one very close to me, Max Max Books and Coventry and Cleveland Nights. Suzanne is a force of nature for writers. <laughs> she grooms us. She takes care of us. Um, I love uh, Book Passage. It's not the Midwest. It's it's California. So I'm. I hope I'm allowed to mention a California oh, totally. bookstore. But Book Passage has been great to me. So just so many, many tattered cover. So many to choose from. Mm. Thank Four you all. Thank you all. California. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank I'll you. Shout out the Raven so in Lawrence, Kansas. Oh, yes. Oh my gosh. Of course. Love Danny. He's awesome. Hey, books. Raven. Another board member. Thank you. Yep. Gosh, thank you, Word. everyone. Word bookstore. I know. Can we just say? Can we just say? This is just two more hours of us yelling books for names. You know, <laughs> I, I feel like we could rewrite the words to Billy Joel's We Didn't Start Fire by just like naming the words, you know? <laughs> oh my God. We should, we should so, try doing that. End of video. Free <laughs> Live, Greenwich Village. I think Trudy is going to be our bookstore ambassador next year and she's going to write the song for us, okay? Right. Amazing. Got it? Right. Yes, please. Let's make well, that Well, everybody. I cannot have asked for a better or more entertaining or more heartwarming final author event for Heartland 2021. Next year, we will be in person again. We're moving full force ahead in that direction. So be in touch with us. Come join us. Promote your, your books with our booksellers. You clearly are all indie bookstore lovers. Thank you, Bracca and Lene. This has been a wonderful yeah. evening, and we'll see you all mm -hmm. next time. Thank, Thank you again. Everyone. Thank you. you guys are great. Thank you. Good to see Thank everybody. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.